Today, I want to talk about uh, uh, how we can actually fine tune code LLMs to do specific downstream tasks, right? Um, but before we even start there, uh, what exactly is a code LLM or what is a code large language model, right? So if you, sorry, yeah. So if you look at uh, one of the most uh, popular or most familiar model would be something that you every day use is like chat GPT, right? So if you ask it some question to generate some text, it can actually generate uh, code, right? So when we talk about code LLMs, uh, it kind of started really with the GitHub Copilot back with their Codex model, which came two, two years ago, right? Um, if you're familiar with large language models, you'll know that they are really just uh, like autocompletes. They just complete the predict the next token, right? So in the context of code, uh, what Codex used to do was to like automatically generate code, just like you would expect it to, right? And then we had a model called Code Davinci, uh, which was the precursor to, which was G based on GPT-3. But what we'll notice is that after that, there's no difference between code and natural language models from OpenAI. Now, does anyone know why? So since chat GPT, they stopped separating, you know, text models and code models. So what people ended up realizing is that to create an LLM, which is good at reasoning, or is an LLM good at natural task or natural language task, you need to train it on code as well. Now, there are many hypotheses of why this is true. Uh, but uh, today, you look if you look at any model, including GPT-4, any of the open source models, which are good at natural language tasks, you will notice that they have a fair bit of code uh, in their pre-training data set, right? Now, one of the hypotheses is that it actually helps the model learn how to do reasoning because after all, programming is just uh, logic, right? So according to Curry, Harvard, Orphomorphism, programs are proofs. So, but we don't know. Actually, the honest answer is we just don't know. Why mixing code uh, in a pre-training uh, of a natural language uh, model actually helps it do reasoning better, right? So this is kind of where we are today. Uh, more recently, uh, GitHub actually introduced the Copilot X, which uh, uses GPT-4, and it allows you to do within your IDE a chat-like interface. So you can ask your model to do uh, Various things with that, right? Now, if you're wondering how, what has been the impact of Copilot over the years? So, this is from uh, GitHub's own studies. So, after the first three or four months of using uh, Copilot, an average developer starts accepting almost more than one third of the suggestions that come from the Copilot, right? So, within three months of usage, if today, based on their own study, because they track the ID uh, uh, completions, uh, they are seeing that 33% of the code that is uh, being generated by Copilot is automatically being accepted by developers, right? Now, so this is code LLM, right? I'm not going to talk about this because everybody knows about this. Uh, what we are going to focus on is actually the open uh, code LLMs. Now, I wish I could retrace the history of all of that like I did with the uh, open AI's models, but it's just too long. And in the last uh, year or so, there have been so many changes in this that I will not be able to do justice. So earlier this year, uh, in April, we actually gave a talk at FOSS uh, Asia, where we covered uh, a number of open source LLMs, uh, which are related to coding. So I'll just point you to that. I think it's available on YouTube. But what I'll do is, in order to set context a little bit, uh, talk about uh, a couple of models, which uh, uh, at some point were state of the art. So this is one model, which is called Star Coder. It is backed by a consortium called Big Code. So service now hugging face a number of companies and over 200 plus researchers. It is interesting because as compared to GPT-4, uh, this model is, uh, the data set is actually freely available. It's been trained on a data set called the stack, which contains only permissible uh, licensed code. So only Apache, BSD, and MIT, right? So, uh, and then, you can also opt out. So if you have some code on GitHub and you, for some reason you don't want it to be included in the model, you can explicitly submit a request. And when they do a training set, they will opt out of the code. Now you'll notice that I actually appended access instead of saying open source. So unfortunately, none of the models which are really available or are state of the art uh, meet the open source definition of OSI, right? So most of them have some sort of restriction. So when we talk about these kind of foundational code models, we use a weaker definition. We just say open access or open, where we not we refer to the fact that the binary uh, model weights are available, right? So you can train and fine tune them. In open access data set, if the data set is available, 
And what you realize in most cases, uh, the data set is also not available, right? Even if the model is claimed to be open. Now, why I put in this here is just to show you a sense of uh, what GP4 did that actually ended up being a, a roadmap of how people pre-train these kind of models. So on the left hand side, you have the star code base, which is a base model available in various sizes. Uh, but that model can only do code completion. So you can just use it to generate the next token of the code, right? Now, how do you go from a auto-completing, auto-generating code completion model to something like a chat GPT where you can chat with it and ask it to follow instructions? There is a process of going through this, right? So what start for the people did this day, they started with the stack, which is a code only data set, but mixed it with natural language text. So this is in contrast to what OpenAI did, where they started with text and they mixed code in, right? So, but the fact of the matter is, in order to get a model which is good at coding, you need to have a data set which contains both natural languages as well as code, right? Uh, then there's a model which they trained on additional 30 million tokens of Python, which is what they call star model. Now, I, you'll notice uh, a lot of people train additionally on Python. Does anyone know why? Anyone want to take a guess? Why Python out of all the languages? Uh, maybe, but I think the most uh, obvious answer is because the most uh, common benchmark used to evaluate these code models is open AI's uh, human eval, which is a benchmark of Python programs. So there's 176 Python programs. So they want to make sure that the model does well in the benchmark. The easiest thing to do is to train additionally on Python a little bit more. Okay. So that I think is the more important reason why everybody does Python instead of, I don't know, like JavaScript or something else. Right. So uh, so then, and that's the model which is the called star code. And then there is a model which is similar, which you can chat with, which is fine tuned from uh, star code with a uncensored variant of an open data set, uh, which is used, which has dialogues, so questions and answers. Okay. And that's how we get started at beta. Now, up until August, this was the state of the art open model. And when I started looking at it, I originally was playing around with star code, right? But in August, Meta actually released Code Llama, which as of today is the state of the art open model. And if you look at the pipeline or the roadmap of how they follow the, the pre training, you'll notice this again, it's very similar. So you have a foundational model. They started with Llama 2, which is trained on natural language text. Uh, they added additional code related training, then Python to make sure we do get all the benchmarks. Uh, and then in the Unique thing about Code Llama is that they do some long context fine tuning, so you can extend the context uh, to up to like 100k if you really wanted to, right? Uh, and then finally, they did instruction fine tuning additionally to create uh, these three sets of models, right? So as of today, this is the state of the art uh, open foundational model for code. And again, it's not open source because technically there is a clause in their license which says that you cannot use it if you have more than I don't know several hundred million users. So practically it doesn't apply to anyone other than the top five other companies like Amazon, Microsoft. Uh, but uh, for everybody else, we can actually use this model commercially and we can build on top of it, right? So I went through all of this just to kind of set a context on it about why we chose Code Llama. Why didn't we choose some other model for the presentation today, right? So as of today, this is the uh, best model that you can use to train on, right? Any questions before I proceed? Okay, so with these models, right, at the end, these three variations, what you get is a model which can generate code. It can also do a number of downstream tasks like fix bugs. It can, you can chat with the model just like you would with a chat GPT, right? But typically, if you have a specific problem that you want to solve, you would have to train the model a bit more or train it further, which is usually referred to as uh, fine tuning. Now, I'll introduce one specific problem which is uh, relevant and I think everybody can relate to it, right? Which is text to SQL generation. Now, what do we mean by this? What do we want to do? We want to give an input or we want to ask a question which is a natural language text and we have a database and we also add the context which is the schema and we want the model to generate the exact query that would actually give us the answer, right? So this is the text to SQL generation problem. Now. Uh, so this is actually taken from Defog. How many of you know actually Defog? So it's a startup. It's YC back. It's actually by a couple of NUS uh, alumni uh, who started it, and they uh, they actually released the model which does this. 
uh, SQL uh, uh, code generation, right? So I took it from there. Uh, but the task that we want to do, or the first thing that we'll do today in our collab is to solve this particular problem, which is how do you take a uh, open model which can generate code and go down to a model which can do some kind of downstream task. Or in this particular case, it has two inputs. One is the question. The other is the context, which gives the entire schema. And then the output expected is the SQL that would actually give you the answer. Okay. Now, without going into too much details of how uh, this works, uh, what we will do today is referred as quantize LoRa. Okay. So when you have a model, it has a state. It's essentially just a large neural network with uh, billions of parameters. When somebody says they do full fine tuning, what they mean is they are actually going to update all the parameters, right? And it require uh, the memory requirements are going to be very high. In contrast, we have LoRa, which is low rank adapters. What happens here is you do not train or retrain or re-update the all set of parameters. You only update a particular layer or you add an adapter layer. So all the uh, parameter updates happen only on the few layers. Okay. So this is usually much faster to do, allows you to train models uh, without using too much memory. But then you'll notice that the base model is still loaded in 16 bits. So if you have like a 34 G, uh, billion parameter model like Code Llama, it will require uh, 34 into 16 into so many uh, megabytes of uh, memory, gigabytes of memory. You can't actually do it on a single GPU if you just do this, right? What uh, this paper introduces is called QLoRa, which is quantized uh, LoRa, where the model is loaded in four bits, right? And also the spikes in memory are handled by paging. So during the training process itself, some of the weights are moved to the CPU and then they are updated there, right? So for doing this, you don't need to know any of the details. It's just that you need to be aware. This is why you can load the model into the GPU because one, it's loaded in four bits. And if there are some additional things, part of the parameter weights are put on the CPU and then they're brought back and updated. Uh, all of this is actually taken care of by libraries. So we don't really need to know the details. So at this point, I hope everybody has got their uh, notebooks because we are going to start the first part. So see if you can go to bit.ly uh, patch codes or you can scan this. And once you have loaded it up, so the only thing you need in addition to this is a hugging face account, but if you don't have it, you can create it fairly easily. Now. So just give you a second to load it up. Uh, does everybody access a cola? Are you able to open it? Okay. All right. So what I'll do is if you did this well, you should end up with something that looks like this. Right. Uh, just give me a second, I'll increase the font. Okay, so you should see something like this. All right. So what we'll do is we'll just walk through this uh, first problem here, which is text to SQL generation, right? And uh, uh, here you'll see that I'm actually using the main branch. Um, when originally Code Lama came, the the currently public uh, transform version didn't work with it. Maybe it works now, but for consistency, just do just run this so that you have all the pre-required dependencies. We will need a GPU. So if you've been using or training things, uh, I know you're on a free account, you may run out of resources, but if you haven't done any of this today, you should be able to have this P4 uh, GPU in your account, which is the accelerator you should choose. So if you just connect here on the P4 GPU, uh, you'll see something like this. Uh, this much RAM and this much space. And once connected, you can actually install all the libraries first. Okay. And just give it a few seconds to install. Okay. So while this is running, what I'll do is I'll just show you uh, the data set that we will use for fine tuning, right? So we just discussed the problem of text to SQL generation. We said there are two inputs. One is the natural query with which you want to find the answer to. 
and the second is the schema, right? Now, if you want to train on this, you need a, to have a data set where somebody has already created this, right? So text, schema, what is the expected query? So either you can create yourself, but, but this is a such well-studied problem that there exists a open and free data set that we can use. So this is B and C2 SQL create context. If you go to your Hugging Face account, you can actually search here. And this isn't the only one. There are many others, uh, but uh, so this is the one which we're using, SQL create context. Right? Now, if you try to preview the data set, you'll see. So here we go. So it has three parts, just like I said. So there's a question, which is, for example, how many heads of the department are older than 56? There is a schema. So in this particular case, there's just a table called head, which has a single uh, column age, which is an integer, right? And then this is the answer. This is the expected answer, which is select on star head by age this, right? So all of the rows, there are around 78K rows here, are of this type, right? So this is the existing data set where somebody is actually verifying the question and the answers, right? So we'll use uh, this particular data set for the fine tuning. So if you installed your dependencies, it should look something like this. And the only reason we use Hugging Face is because it makes this management of data sets and hosting the models very easy. So if you have your account, you can log in. Otherwise, just hit create one, and then you can copy your uh, token, and then just paste it here, right? And once you do that, for the rest of the notebook, you will not need to log in again, right? So you should see something like this, and then we are set. Okay. So at any point, if you're stuck, feel free to raise your hand. I'll be happy to come in and help you. Right. So we'll use this data set to train the model. And the next step you'll see is that uh, you can just load the data set using the data set library from our interface. And what I see here is I'm actually just selecting 100 uh, elements from it. Okay. Because the entire data set is 76 K rows. And if I start training on that, we will not be able to finish within the time frame. So what I'll do is I'll make a very small sample. And then basically you can choose whatever you want. You can do, you can probably do thousand. It'll take a few minutes, but hundred will certainly finish immediately. So that's the only reason why I'm using hundred. Okay. So only taking hundred rows from the data set. So if you run this, you'll notice that there is a function called format instruction. Now this is just a function to get to the model uh, of the template that we will use for training. So what we want our model to do at the end is to be able to take input in this form or this structure. So some question, some context, and then the answer part is what we want the model to generate, right? So this function just takes the data set and then processes it to be of this particular format. That's all, right? So if I run this, uh, I think the only thing I print here is the length. So you'll see that it prints, it downloads the data set and then it will just print 100. All right. So again, we're just using 100 so that we can finish this in time. Now, there's another section here, but you don't need to expand it right now. We'll do another round of this and then we'll look at part 16. Now we come to this part, which is where we load the model. Now, I mentioned that there are four, uh, three different sizes, 7, 3, 13, and 34 billion. Now, in the free resources of this P4 GPU provided by Google, Collab, we can only load the 7 billion model. Okay, so we are going to try with that. You could use any one of them. You could use uh, the base, which is 7 billion uh, HF, or you could use the Python version. So I just use this. There's no difference. The only difference is additionally trained on Python. Right, so this is the model ID. Uh, bits and bytes is this library which allows you to load the model in four bits. So you just use the config this just says that load the model in four bits. What is the quantization type, etc. Um, the device map is used to tell the model where it will be loaded. So it's a single GPU. If you have multiple GPUs, you can give one, two, three, four, whatever ID of the GPU where you want the model to go. And then after that, you can just load the model as you will do uh, usually. Right. So this line loads the model and this loads the tokenizer. So once if you run it first time, you'll notice it takes some time. So it'll download the two files, which is around nine GB in size. So it'll download it locally and then uh, it'll load it up. Okay. After that is the part where we do the uh, LoRa configuration for uh, quantized. Uh, so all of these are actually hyperparameters, and the ones which are picked there are just from the papers. So 16.1 R 64. 
So the meaning of all of these and then how we can adjust those, I uh, will refer you to the paper. Uh, but for if you're just starting out, you can just choose these values. Okay. So these are actually the hyperparameters for training. We'll just use them. And finally, we have the training arguments for the trainer. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar what is a so usually we have 100 uh, rows in the data set. This controls how many times you run it on. So when we say two, it means it will train it twice. So all the 100 rows and then again, right? Usually for most uh, of fine tuning purposes, you don't have to go beyond three. I mean, you could even do one here, right? So I just put two. Um, some of these steps are just for, uh, so the saving strategy is just how often will we save the checkpoints. Uh, this controls the precision in which the base model is loaded. The other interesting thing here is the um, scheduler. So you may have a learning rate. You can put constant here or you can put cosine. So this is how the learning rate is adjusted. So if you put cosine, it starts high up and then it goes down gradually, which is what we use. The last two lines are just to disable some uh, printing on the polar here. And this report tool is just to disable the um, weights and biases logging, which is otherwise by default it will try to log into this, right? So just the trainer arguments. So I just so this is actually all pretty standard. So if you follow any transformer tutorial, you'll see the same things. They all use this atom uh, optimizer. They use the cosine learning rate schedule, right? Right. So after that, the next thing is you can actually decide what is the max sequence length for the model. So this really just depends on the input. So the code llama model I showed you, it can take a very large context length, right? Up to like 3200K or whatnot. But most of our inputs are going to be less than 512 tokens. If you look at it, it's not uh, too big. Most of them are like this, right? The only thing to be careful is you can put a bigger number, like 1024, 2000, all. It would actually increase the memory requirement during training. So uh, if you do more than 512 in this uh, collab sheet, it will not work with the free resources. So I just put it here so that we can go through uh, using this free uh, collab. But otherwise, you could use a larger sequence. But this is just used during the training. So if you're in your training, if all the uh, items fit within 512 tokens, then you don't need to use this. Okay. So this doesn't have any impact on inference. So when you're running the model, you can still have a, the same larger context. All right. So the, the function that we had created to format the input, the, the format instruction we passed it here. There's something called packaging, which is uh, which can actually uh, take multiple inputs and pass them directly to the model, but you can just put through here. Um, and then once everything works, you should be able to do a training run. And you should be able to see something which says that it was printed. So what you'll notice first is the model will be loaded. And once it's loaded, you realize that uh, it will reach very close to 15 GB. So we can't really load a model more than this size uh, on this notebook. Right, so you'll see it's picking up right here. So there are some warnings, but you can uh, ignore them. Not, uh, not critical. Okay, so this actually just finished. Okay, so because we just gave 100 samples, it managed to finish it within a minute, right? And it'll print something like this. What was the loss? What was the number of folks it ran? And in your collab, you will have a, a run folder, which is where we, we put the output. And you'll see that there are two checkpoints so that every um, and each checkpoint will have this adapter model dot bin which contains the binary weights for the LoRa adapter right so you'll notice i can't see the size here but it's not uh, like 9 gb or something so this is much much smaller right so what it means is that this only trains only a few layers it doesn't train the entire all sets of parameters so this usually will be like a few megabytes in size. It will not be as big as the model itself, right? And if I go back here, so the next thing you can do is you can actually just load this adapter, which is in the model output directory, 
along with the base model and then try to see how you're able to do text to SQL generation. Okay. So you still have the base model, which is code llama, Python 7B, you know, the really large 7 million parameters. And then you load just this particular adapter, which is a few megabytes in size. And then you do the inference together. So if you do this, just on the next line. So LoRa actually allows you to train different uh, LoRa models and then add them at the top during inference. So if you're familiar with OpenAI, 3.5, they also have a fine tuning API, right? And uh, they are able to provide it through an API and then you can just query your own trained model. So they're probably doing something like this because it's very expensive to fine tune the whole model. They can't really do it for everyone uh, with an API call. What they're likely training is just an adapter, which they can then add to their base model for you to do the inference at runtime. Okay. So this is what allows you to train, like you can fine tune um, uh, an adapter per use case like we did here or you could even find an adapter per customer if you're building a service because that's usually very lightweight and it takes uh, depending on how much data you have you can actually do it per customer and then you can provide an interface to that customer right so you will note here that it's going to load the model uh, the full shards and then the adapter and then we can test it right so how do we test it so you have to remember how we gave the prompt, right? We formatted it like this, which is there is some question, which is the question we want to ask in natural language. There is some context, which is where we put the schema. So the, all the create table statements, and then there's the answer, which we expect. So here there's the answer is just old. So what I do is I just load the same data set again. Then I just take a random row from the data set, right? And then uh, I'll just give that as input to the model and ask it to generation with this prompt. Right. So this prompt is just passed on to the model and then we use a standard setting. So temperature, coffee, you just use a standard setting and you just generate 512 tokens. So let's see if it's able to work. So let's just do it right and run. And then in your code, you should be able to run it and see how it works. Uh, so what I'm printing here is the original prompt, which is what we're giving. And then they generated a response. And then we also know the ground truth because I'm using the data set to see. So I have the ground truth. And then we can compare these to see whether the response generated from the model is, you know, same as the ground truth, which is there in the data set, right? So that should tell us. So remember, mind you, we have only done 100 rows, okay? So it may not work for the whatever thing is picked up, but let's see. So here we go. So this is the question that says, how many games have a score of 3-3? Three, three? I don't know what this four three. Over time, yeah. So three, three over time, right? And then the table is just this, which is also the input. There is a there are two columns, game and score. And this is the response from the model, right? So select count star from table where score is. And you'll notice that there is some spurious uh, text which is printed outside this, right? So so because there's no way to control the output, all we said is just fine tune it. So it generates this and it generates some extra text. But if I ignore it and I go back to this is the actual ground rules, which is select count game from table, right? And what did we generate? We generated this, which would work, but probably not the ideal, but still okay. Uh, why don't we run it again and see for some other example? So the output you'll notice it has things outside it. So usually when you implement it as part of an application, you'll have to ignore or remove those lines. So in this particular case, you can actually just extract the SQL code out because it was prompted with a, a markdown syntax. So I'll run it again and then I'll show you. So usually after fine tuning, you will have to do some sort of post uh, uh, processing if you really want uh, to extract. So for example, here the question is which championship had a final score of this and it's probably tennis. And then this is the schema. So there's a championship score in final. I think in this case, the response is not correct. Right, so this was the ground group. It should have actually generated something like this, right? But mind you, we've only trained for 100 examples. So if you train it for more, hopefully it will give you a score. Which I, let's just try one more, and then we'll see how to save the model. This case it didn't generate before. Yeah. 
Uh, this, if you get something like this, probably we need to train more, right? So uh, this is not, it has not generated anything. The generated response actually has a bunch of spurious text in it. Okay. So what I'll do now is I'll just pause this and then I'll show you one final thing. So you've generated the model and you've trained it, but remember it's still, it's just in the form of an adapter. Now, what if you actually want to publish the full model so that people don't need to load the adapter separately? So you have to do what's called merging. So you have to actually merge the model, but you'll notice that we're very close to the memory. So what you do, just run these few lines to delete the trainer and the model, and then we'll load it again. So hopefully this should give you some more space. And this is just because of collab, right? So we are trying to balance the resources. And after this, if you run this line, uh, what we're doing is we are reloading the model in uh, floating point 16 and then merging it uh, with the LoRa weights, which is just the adapter. Okay. So the base model and then the model we just trained from the model directory, we merge them together and then we can actually push it to hugging face. So, uh, so this would actually just push it to this org repository and private to means that it will stay private. But if you want, you can push it to your own uh, personal account. And uh, you'll have the train model available on your hugging face account, right? Okay, so now it will load up again and it will push. Let me just say, yeah, so zip and then it'll go back up and then hopefully it will push it back. So, what I do is I just keep it running and quickly go back to my slide. So, any questions before we go to the next part? Did everyone manage to train? Okay, did, did your model actually work better than what I had, which is like, did it write a few times? Does it generate? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you have to train for, so you can try next time, at least try thousand rows. So, I mean, hundred is very less, right? So we just, for what? From hugging face. Okay. I can, I can take a look at that. Yes. Good. It didn't explain. It was just coming from the base model. The explanation. So all the additional things after the answer, which is not a SQL query, is just coming because the base Python has that information already. So in our application, we would ignore it. We will ignore it. Oh no! So you can't push into my repo. So here you have to give your name. Sorry. Uh, so that patch code is my repository. So here put your username and then the model. So yeah. So I think I had an error by pushing. Let me. Uh, yeah, so don't try to push to patch code because that's not your repository. You here you need to push into your own. So give your username and then whatever you want to name the model, right? So I use patch code because that's a org on hugging face which we own, and this is where we pushed uh, the model, right? So but if you if you have your own personal account, then it will go to your own account. So you can just put your username and then it will appear here and any name you want to give to the model. So just change that last line. Yeah, just don't uh, push it. Yeah. Yeah, so this line, just give it, give your username and whatever you want to call the model and then uh, push and then you'll have it on your face account. Okay, any other question? Yeah. So all the extra text you saw was coming from the base model itself because we didn't really fine tune it for, so all of this, right, generated response, explanation, code, this is actually not what we want. Uh, our response should be just the SQL, right? So if you fine tune it for a, a larger data set, you'll see that. Usually there's still maybe something else because as I said, the only way to stop this is either explicitly look for a pattern or the length because here we gave 512 tokens so it will generate up to 512 tokens and it will just continue going on whatever is there. So usually you can actually just look for the exact SQL after this answer if it is not there then you won't pick it up in your application. So in this particular case it didn't really generate anything. Okay, any other questions? So everybody managed to train and push. Any other question before I show one more example? No? Okay, so what I'll do is very quickly go to the next part. So, so hopefully this will give you some idea of how you can uh, fine tune a code LLM for a downstream task, like text to uh, SQL generation, right? So let's take a look at some other downstream tasks. How about bug fixing? So Code generation models are good at uh, doing, you know, starting from scratch. So you just give it a doc string or you tell what code you want to generate and it can generate a code. 
But fixing a bug is usually much more harder because you're not making a starting from scratch, right? You're actually making a change in the middle somewhere. There is some context before the, the change, there is some bug, and then there's some response. So what I mean by bug fixing is something like this, where a model is just given some instruction, which just says fix bug in Fibonacci, and then the code snippet, which has a bug, right? And we don't even tell the model like where the bug is or what exactly it is. And then the expected output is this, which is the case version, right? So usually it means that you can't use a base code generation model because it requires the model to be chatty or be able to follow instructions. So it needs a instruction fine tuning, right? Now, if you were to actually build something like this, which is input is this and the instruction and one output, what, how would you do it? So you have to create a data set, right? Where you have a lot of bugs and fixes. And then you also have some text which tells like what was fixed in it, right? And one easy way to do that is to actually look at commits because, and this is one insight of probably like, I've had only like very few ideas in life. And this is one of the good ideas I've had, which is that in order to look at how software developers build code, it's important to analyze it longitudinally, which is commit by commit by commit, rather than looking at a point in time, right? So if you look at most of the models, including GPT-4, Code Llama, they are trained at one point in time. They are not trained at commits as they progress and they do not have this evolutionary history, right? So in my previous uh, startup, we actually uh, used the commit data very well. We, this is from our paper in uh, uh, 2020 uh, around a machine learning approach for vulnerability curation. So this was pre LLM, right? So we use like uh, deep learning, but that's the same insight. So commits, it turns out are actually a very good source of instruction tuning code LLMs. Why? Because they have all the ingredients. So you have something before, which is a code before, then you have a code after, and then you have a instruction, which is really the commit message, right? Now, obviously many commit messages are not that good, but if you could filter out the really good commit messages, this is really the format which we need in order to do uh, or train a model for fixing bugs, for example, right? So. So that's the next task we'll do. I think we have some time, so I'll go through it. Um, you go back to the same notebook. Now, either you can come up with your own data set, so which is like process GitHub and then figure out where you want to get it. Or you can use, so it turns out there are some data sets which we can reuse, which people have uh, built. And I'll just show you one of those. So this is called, uh, it's again from GitHub. So it's called commit. So you see there are many. I'm just going to use this one, commit back empty. Okay. So, so this is the data set we'll use. So this one you'll notice is actually split by programming language type. So maybe we go to Python just to give you a sense of what it contains. So it, all it contains is actually commits taken from GitHub and they are pre-processed to be uh, high quality, right? So the Python one contains 56,000 files. And so, so there's a commit ID, there's a file name, but at the end of the day, there are these two things, which is what was the content of the file previously, which is old content and what is the new content, right? And it contains the commit message. So what was the actual instruction? And you'll notice there's a lot of fix fix already in this, right? So, so intuition tells me that this is actually a good uh, data source for tuning for bug fixing, right? So if you go back to the same notebook that you have, hopefully actually the internet is very slow here. So I'll do is I'll just pause it. So I will not push. Okay, I'm gonna just restart. So everything is the same. What has changed is that we'll probably use a new data set to train it. Okay, so, so if you go through the same steps again, and you come to this data set part, you can actually hide this one. And if you unhide the one which I already had for bug fixing, you'll notice that I have code to load this data set, which is commit back empty. Now, this data set has some additional columns. It's not in the format that we want, uh, which is like the commit format, which I showed, right? So what you can do is you can just remove those extra columns. So if we go here, you'll see there are some other things like uh, old content, or new file, old file. So if you don't need this, we'll just remove them. So, which is what we do here, right? So, so 
Okay. And then our uh, prompt format will be something like this, which is so this is actually a standard format for uh, it's called alpaca style format. So you have three triplets. We have an instruction which tells the model you need to do something, the instruction. And then there is an input. In this case, it will be the code before the commit. And then there is an output, or which is the response here. Okay. So this is just to format. So from the data set, we remove additional columns, and then we're going to format it like this, right? Now you'll notice what I did here is uh, there's like 56,000 uh, entries, right? So what are the ones we picked? So I wanted to train it on fixing bugs. So I actually do a little bit of processing here. So what I say is, hey, as long as in the commit uh, sub message subject, you have the letters fix and bug, we'll only use those rows, right? So this is just to process the data set and make it more focused on what we actually wanted to do. So you'll notice that from 56,000, we end up with like 625 rows, okay? So all of these, the commit message contains the word fix and bug. That's all, right? And my intuition is that hopefully this means that the commit will be related to a bug fix. Now, with this, the rest of the thing is just the same. So the data set, so all that we change is the data set. And then if you run, uh, I'll just update this output directory so that it's a new directory. Otherwise, everything else is the same. Now, in this case, you notice because there are 600 rows, it'll actually take, a, take some amount of time. I don't know whether we'll be able to finish it. Uh, but hopefully we can, and then we can see the output. Okay, so once it is done, we can again load it. And then if you unhide the one which about bug fixing, you'll notice that uh, it's again the same story. In order to test it, I again open up the same data set. I pick a random row from it. And then I give it the subject, the old content, and I compare it with the generated response, right? So, oops. Ah, so this was the run which I actually did earlier, where it did give a correct answer, right? So usually for the SQL, uh, if you train it well enough, then the answer should actually just contain something like this that you can extract. So in your response, from the answer, you can just extract the markdown SQL. Everything else is actually spurious. I mean, it may be useful, but you don't know what it will generate. So like the expected result is just like a, uh, I don't know, it's like a table showing the actual table, right? So if you, and this was the correct answer. So in this case, it actually generated the exact answer. So you have to do a little bit of processing on the generated response uh, to see the result, right? Okay, this will take some time. So uh, let's see. Okay, so we came all the way here and so it has started training. Uh, I think 100 rows it took, or it was almost instantaneous. Maybe it'll take a few minutes with 600 uh, rows. As it's training, uh, any questions? We use that time rather than staying idle. Can you think of any other downstream task on which you want to apply what you're learning here today? So, as a developer, what else uh, that you do that you think might be useful? documentation right so in that case uh what would be the approach so so his thing is slightly reverse of what we have been doing here which is like given a piece of code you want to generate the documentation right yeah so how would you do it if you were to do that if you want to follow the same pattern so you actually need to look for uh, places where you actually have code and documentation together right um, actually there is a so rather than instead of looking for like programming language repositories or files, the notebooks are actually a very good source of that. So many times notebooks will have text. I don't have any text here, but if you actually look at Jupyter notebooks, they have a lot of text and then they have a code right next to the text, right? So you could actually train a model on a set of notebooks where the input is the code block and the output is the markdown which describes what the code does usually, right? And in that case, you'll be able to get something which would work well, right? Any other, any other example that you think you can find? So whatever we did today, by the way, it will work the same uh, if you want to train the, you know, the 34 million uh, models. So I didn't really show. Uh, so you just need to change this to 
I mean, if you're doing it on your own uh, machine or if you're doing it on paid Colab, you can just change this and it will all work the same all the way to 34. Okay. It's just that it requires more memory. So you can do 34 bit on a single A180 GB, which uh, in most places is just like one, two dollars per hour. So it's very, very affordable to do fine tuning for state of the art models. Uh, for your own use case, so it's not 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 expensive at all, right? So you don't need to own GPUs for most places. You will get a uh, get it for discount. Okay, so just being conscious of time, I think this may not finish. So let me see where we are. Yeah. So in this case, because last time there was only one uh, operator, so you notice here that uh, this is what is printed. So there's the learning rate, this is the loss function, and then we are still at point one three, right? And we said we want to go till two, so it'll take some time uh, to train this, right? Um, but once you train it, you can actually use the this part here to test it, and then the same way you can actually push it as a full model into your repository. Okay, so I think I have like five minutes, and I do want to leave some time for like general training. So if you're running it, let it run. But happy to answer any questions, um, not necessarily related to what we did, but otherwise also about LLMs and things. If you have, please feel free to ask. Do you use Google Connect option in your own workflow, or is it just that to rest the server and run it locally? Colab, uh, not so much because uh, so the reason for that is. Uh, uh, so 7 billion model, although is good, the state of the art has moved. So at least 34 is what you need to train, which can't be done on the well, I actually use run pod, which is a service which provides it. I think I can, let me just show you very quickly of uh, it, but it's very similar. You can get like a Jupyter notebook very easily and you can get access to good quality uh, GPUs that you can use uh, relatively affordably. So for training, uh, the way I showed you, I use a very similar script which is in a notebook because there's a lot of experimentation that happens right uh, before we can. So yeah, this is how it looks like. So you can actually, so you notice that many of them are not, so there's big GPU shortage, right? So you will notice many of the big ones, you can barely ever find it, but our purpose, we can actually use this. So you can actually use a ATGB 800 to, to do this. So this is what I usually do, um, but there is a lot of experimentation. So because of that, uh, I do tend to use only Colab for the fine tuning part. So once the model is ready and pushed out, for inference, we usually deploy it on a endpoint and this is like an API report, right? So if you want to serve for a, for example, a customer. But I wanted to show you because we just recently did train a fairly large model, uh, which we released uh, publicly, which is uh, which is called Batch uh, Code of 34B, which is very similar to the last thing we did. Okay, so this one is the model that we trained from Code Llama, and uh, we, if you look at the results, um, so we are actually, uh, in terms of, there are some models which are better in terms of human eval, but they are using data sets which are not open, or they use OpenAI and API for training, which then goes against their terms, right? But we actually use open data sets, and our model is actually, uh, compares favorably to GPT-4 for the task with which we evaluate. So this is a bug fixing specific uh, benchmark for bug fixing. And this is a benchmark which we created ourselves. It's called static analysis eval. It's for checking for vulnerability detection. So we, the model that we tuned is actually quite, uh, quite comparable to GPT uh, for that. But what I wanted to show you was that uh, it requires a number of runs. So like, uh, and usually you end up using a something that can uh, manage these failures. Uh, maybe if there's another question, I can, I can log it. Yeah. 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 yeah, but like there's like over hundred runs which I had to do uh, during the fine tuning to reach this point, right? Trying various things. So the easiest way to do it is to use a notebook. Um, the only context in which uh, I would need to do something else is if you are training on multiple GPUs, if you're doing full fine tuning. So then you have other libraries like DeepSpeed. So then you might have to write some script and deploy. But for a simple task, which we are doing, which is just single 
uh, model on a single GPU, the notebooks are actually towards that. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Hopefully, you found it useful. All right, hi guys, welcome back. So for our next talk, we have an EMS founder. His name is uh, Raiva, and he is a founding en engineer in the education tech space. So today he'll be talking about his experiences in building uh, when he was an amateur programmer and the behind the scenes stories of his hacks, going from prototypes to real world usage and how he got academic credit even for his skill hacks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so as he is now pointing the river, and I'm an alumnus of the 2022 batch uh, so not uh, too long ago, I was a student, uh, and at US, I did a CS and USP, which is now called Indus College. And when I entered university, a very common question uh, was, why did you choose CS? Right, a lot of admissions interviews uh, ask you this question, and my answer to that, uh, and my reason for doing CS, uh, was to build things and solve problems. And my answer specifically uh, in one of the NUS interviews was that if I have a CS education, it is so versatile that I can go into any kind of uh, faculty or department here at NUS, uh, you know, in any room, uh, no matter what problem they are discussing, uh, I could go in and say that, you know, I can make your life easier or I can make your uh, job run faster or make your solution better, right? So that's, that's the power of what I thought a CS education uh, could have. And while at NUS, I have done some of these uh, hacks uh, and tried to, you know, build those things. And I hope that with this talk, um, I can also encourage you to go on and build these uh, things yourself as well. So how many of us have taken CS101 in the last uh, few years? I'm sure of hands, and we see one, two. I think quite a lot of uh, students here, right? So uh, if you have taken CS LMS ever since 2019, uh, I think you may have used something called the attendance bot, the CS LMS bot, all right? Uh, show of hands if you have used the bot, right? Oh yeah, I see, I see a lot of hands. Uh, that's great, right? So that was actually my first hack um, as a freshman in university. So that was built by me and my friends. Um, and the story is that in the pre-COVID times, uh, in 2018, 19, all the classes were actually offline at NUS. And what used to happen is the attendance taking was done via uh, name calling or via uh, passing a sheet. And that used to take easily five to seven minutes extra in a class of let's say one hour uh, and let's say 20 to 25 people. It would take a lot of time uh, to do this attendance tracking. And which meant that I, I was actually missing my bus. Uh, right, so I, I, I had to travel uh, between two parts of the campus and the frequency wasn't great. So I had to miss the bus and I had to like wait 10 to 15 minutes extra uh, depending on which tutorial session it was and it really frustrated me. So I got together with um, a team, uh, two of my friends, uh, and I built this uh, prototype. So I think some of you who have used it uh, may be familiar with the interface, but I'll just explain it again. So what happens, how the bot works is that, let's say if you're a TA, right? And what you have to do is you have to basically count the number of people in your classroom at that time. So if you tell the bot that you're, let's say 25 people in the class today, uh, it'll give you something like an OTP, which we call a token. And then you write it down on the board for the students. So the student has to do a one-time setup. Uh, I think some of you have probably done it. Uh, and then you're basically just going to use that token uh, to mark your attendance. Right now, you may ask, like, what if someone cheats, right? Uh, if we ever wanted to uh, get this to be used by anyone um, in NUS and actually save our time, we need to think about how will we prevent cheating. So what happens is, let's say if uh, someone who is outside the class manages to register their attendance, right? But the bot knows that there is an X amount of people, uh, only that they can mark their attendance. So what actually happens um, in real time is that that attendance is actually marked in real time on Google Sheets. So we have our Python Telegram bot uh, running, uh, our server running, and that server actually updates the Google Sheet that is uh, accessible to the module staff uh, and whoever the TA is in real time. So let's say if uh, someone outside the classroom manages to mark their attendance, right? Someone inside the classroom will not be able to mark their attendance. Uh, by the virtue of there being a limit on who can mark or how many people can mark 
uh, their attendance. And then the TA can quickly go in the Google Sheet uh, and see for themselves who is not in the class but has still marked their attendance correctly. So it doesn't improve the worst case. In the worst case, of course, the TA has to go in and see who is uh, not here but still present according to the attendance sheet. But it does improve the average case, right? And slowly, as you know, you people know that they can't cheat, uh, they will and stop doing those things, right? So it greatly improves the time uh, that it took uh, for people to you know record attendance. But the but the product that we built initially wasn't um, as good. So the product actually was built in a research suite. And I, I had uh, three friends, including me. So that was Alpe and Chaitanya, uh, who coincidentally happened to also be from Ingress Hackers. And what we did, uh, as you can see on the right side here, is a very, very simple uh, prototype. And in this prototype, the TA had to actually go in and copy the auth code from, from Google. It was a very cumbersome process and not a great practice to be very honest. And initially, this was used unofficially in CS 2040. So we had uh, one of our friends who was a TA himself, and he also empathized with this problem because he was teaching a class of, I think, 25, and he had three classes like that, and it was becoming very, very cumbersome for him to maintain these records for himself. Uh, and imagine that you have to maintain these records for 10 weeks of a semester typically, so that is um, a crazy amount of data to maintain as well. So initially we, we uh, launched this and we had only our friend using it. And then we then our friend reached out to his colleagues and his friends uh, to try this out. Uh, and then we got some uh, feedback uh, from other TAs, right? So I will only find this screenshot, uh, apologies, but there was definitely negative feedback as well. So it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, this solution is great. This is the best uh, thing we have used, right? So we, we got feedback, we worked on the feedback uh, during the semester and that's where we were. So there was a time when I think a lot of the TAs were using this solution and we were pretty happy, uh, but we didn't know what to do with it next, right? We, we didn't, we hadn't even thought of what the future would be for something like this. Like we were just happy, like solving our own problem. So at least I was not missing my buses uh, and I was just happy with that. And my friend was happy that he didn't have to maintain attendance records for all of his students, which I think was about 75 to 80 people. Uh, but uh, things took a different turn. So we were just having a casual catch-up conversation with uh, Prof. Martinez, uh, and we told him what we have been up to in class, what we have been working on weekends and late nights. Uh, and then he invited us to try it out for CS 111s, which is the introduction to programming class in MS uh, for CS students. So in 2019, just a semester after after we initially built this, we actually launched it for. Or CS as so in that time before before uh, launching going from the prototype to actually building the product that all of you have used, uh, we worked closely with the teaching team to implement features that they needed and also to really refine and make sure that the bot could support the load. So for example, CS twenty forty, you're still dealing with you know not not a great number of students, but CS one hundred one s I think when we started had an enrollment of about six hundred people. I think today it is eight hundred. Uh, so we just made sure that it was really ready for launch. Uh, we also added custom features. So let's say, uh, I think what we added was the ability for students to check their own statistics uh, for the attendance. So let's say if you missed a class in week seven and you asked the bot for attendance statistics, it could tell you that you don't have a mark for week seven. And in case you thought that was an error, you could go and follow up with the TA. Uh, so since we launched, uh, we have been in use for five years now. Uh, with about 4,000 users, uh, I think probably more. Initially, it was also used um, by the teaching team for their own meetings. I think the module has a teaching team strength of about 90 people, uh, at least during that time. So it was also used internally for teaching team meetings. And the reason it has worked is because it requires almost no maintenance. Uh, so that is one plus point uh, of this system. And, and the result is that we have our happy customers. So this is Prof. Martinez's message to us in, in 2023 at the start of this semester. Uh, and we're really happy that we built something uh, and we're happy that our customer was happy. So what did we learn, right? So remember that when we started, two of the people on the team were year one students. 
and algorithms against them as well. So we were halfway through uh, learning data structures and algorithms. We were halfway through learning what OOP was, uh, and which is why the tech part of the learning was immense, right? We, I think none of none of the year one students I know had like professional experience writing Python, right? So we, we learned about Python, we learned about Telegram API, we learned about Google spreadsheets, Google API, Google authentication, uh, which I missed out here, I think. Uh, how do you design a system? Uh, how do you do maintenance? How do you do data cleaning? So one funny incident from uh, 2019 is that uh, how the system works is that we take data from NUSS system, which at that time was IPLE or Luminous, I don't remember. But the problem was that all of these matriculation numbers that students have, uh, there was for some reason they were trading and leaving spaces. So what happened is when students tried to register on, on the bot, uh, the bot could not find their matriculation number uh, inside the Google spreadsheet, which threw up a lot of errors. Right. So to fix that, you know, this happened one or two times, uh, and someone reached out to me. So I said, "Hey, you know, just just telegram me their uh, matriculation number or email me their, their matriculation number. I'll go and add that manually." Turns out, I think this error was so prevalent that I got so many messages that I still have those hundred messages on my telegram. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, there is. So, but initially, like us being amateur programmers, we had not we had not implemented that inside the code. So, turns out that this thing actually blew up, and I still have hundred messages from those days on my email and on my Telegram because the error was so prevalent. Right. So, this is this is a mistake we we learned from. Sorry. Yeah, so, so the question is that, oh, you could have, um, you know, had an issue on the GitHub repository, right? So another fun fact is that as year one students, like just starting to use GitHub, we were not even familiar with using GitHub really well. So I think what we use for issue tracking is just internal messages. That's how MVP we were, right? And in terms of non-tech learning as well, we learned a lot about working with users. Uh, both technical and non-technical. So we worked with users who are super familiar with how um, you know technical systems work. We we also worked with students who were not really familiar with how to use the product well. There are some students who are using Telegram for the first time. So great learning experience, right? The next hack um, I want to talk about this this came slightly later. Uh, so as we all know, in 2020. Uh, there was a COVID-19 circuit breaker in Singapore uh, when, uh, you know, there was a quarantine and lockdown period where you could not go out to eat. And coincidentally, during that time in the US, uh, I think there were renovations in University Town where I lived. And because of that, uh, the canteen, I think one of the canteens was closed. And because of that, the number of food options were severely limited. So people started ordering food delivery. And when we did that, we quickly realized that this is really expensive, right? I think normally what you would spend uh, for a canteen meal in school is the delivery fee you would pay during those times uh, for getting food, uh, you know, one time. So what I wanted to do is pool orders from people uh, to split delivery costs. Because essentially, if you think of people living in university town, the address is more or less the same, you know, like regardless of which college or which residence you live in. It's hardly a walk away to you know get food from somewhere else. So this is something I wanted to do, right? Uh, of course, I mean my first thought was okay, let's do a human bot. Right? Why not build a bot? But I realized that to go and build a bot would it take time, and I wasn't really sure how to do it. Like even after building that, that attendance bot, I wasn't really sure how I could um, you know build this bot where there's like multiple users interacting and building an order together. So I said, okay. So I teamed up with a friend, uh, started this Telegram channel. Uh, it was called Baba Wana. Uh, the first word is, because I think most of you would be familiar with that, it means to take away. And Wana is, is actually from, from some of the Indian languages, which is the ending for someone who does something. So this roughly translates to someone who takes away food. Right? So what we did is we made this Telegram channel uh, where we would send out messages. Uh, for places we were ordering food from every day, uh, and you would get orders uh, from people, and 
we would just you know use this channel to disseminate the information. So I see on the right, we would update people when food was there, uh, where the collection point was, etc. And of course, this grew with word of mouth as well because who doesn't like saving money, right? And it was so manual uh, that, and this, this is a welcome message you can see. Uh, it was really manual. So the only problem this uh, Telegram channel solved for us was communication. We didn't want to go out to everyone individually, uh, spam them every time you're ordering something uh, to be like, hey, you know, this is what we are ordering. So there was this channel. Uh, we would post orders when we were ordering food. Uh, if someone wanted to order, they should would DM the person who started the order, which was usually me or my friend who started this. Um, and everything was manual. Like calculation of delivery fees uh, for, for each person, calculation of what their share was, uh, when the food would, would arrive, who would order, everything was manual, right? It was a very, very MVP thing. But we didn't end up building any product here, right? So as I said, people love saving money, right? But for how long? We, we realized uh, after running this well for a while, I'm sorry, I don't have the statistics, but I remember we ordered every single day for a while. Uh, but then we realized that this had a limited use case. Why? Because the renovation wasn't going to last forever. Uh, COVID-19 was not going to last forever. And ultimately, we needed to think that are people willing to do this even in a normal world where, you know, let's say this was during the summer uh, break, during school. Uh, a lot of us live in residential colleges where meal plans are catered every day during the normal course of the semester. Right? So did it make sense to go ahead um, and build a product that would do something like this? So as you can see on the right, we did think about a lot of these things. Like for example, uh, we wanted anyone to be able to start an order or to be able to vote on restaurants, right? Like why should someone only order food from a place that I want to order food from? Right? So we thought of everything, but ultimately decided not to build it uh, because we thought that it was probably not uh, worth our time. Uh, to go and build something that we weren't really sure would deliver value for uh, our users, right? So, but there was great learning even without explicitly coding anything. So, what I mean is, in terms of tech, there was definitely learning in terms of how do we design a system. So, as we saw on the previous page, we did eventually think of how we would build that system. And even though we didn't build that system explicitly, there was a great amount of learning and thinking that how we would go and end up doing. It was very similar to a system design we uh, There was also learning in terms of payment APIs. So definitely while trying to build that product, we looked up how we could automate payments as well, which was also a great learning for uh, another year two student. In terms of non-tech learning, I think that's where this particular hack shines. So we learned, of, we learned the idea of understanding of value proposition. So really understanding what makes sense for users and what doesn't make sense for users. Uh, and knowing when to stop, right? I think that is that was very important for us. You know, it would it would seem very cool to go and build something that that looks cool, but if people don't use it, uh, we didn't think that you know that was something that was valuable. The third uh, uh, hack I want to talk about uh, is is very AI related, which is, is related to the talk that we had previously today as well. So, how many of us have not used ChatGPT? I see a hand, one, one hand here in a, in a big room, um, right? So I think mostly everyone has used uh, chat GPT, right? So in, in uh, year three, when I was in year three, I had this idea of building something like chat GPT, uh, but for learning to program. And that was at my own annoyance of not finding it easy to learn to program. And I think that's the case for a lot of people actually. And the reason to build this is um, in, in, in CS, uh, at NUS, we used to follow this textbook, uh, which is SICPGS. I think a lot of people here would be familiar with that. And they would also know that the correct answers to some of these questions uh, can change every year, right? Like they can change uh, minutely every year. And what I realized uh, looking at the student forums is that people used to ask similar questions every year. And the answer to them would depend on what has been taught in the module that year. Uh, specifically. So there was no easy way for uh, someone to Google something uh, and understand that concept, unless it is a general enough concept that is uh, applicable in other programming languages as well. So I had this idea of uh, building an AI agent, like an AI uh, teaching assistant that could answer questions that 
you know, people were asking frequently. Um, and the way I thought of doing it is uh, crowdsourcing uh, question answer pairs from students. So this is something that we already had uh, in some of the forums. So what I wanted to do was encourage students to go and uh, ask even more questions and then take those question answer pairs and then really try uh, and train an agent to be able to answer questions like that. So I think in the earlier talk today, we saw uh, fine tuning, right? So there's something, there's something similar to fine tuning. Uh, so the thing is, we opened, so we opened this repository. I think this still exists, right? Where it's a dead repository. Uh, so as you can see, I think it only has nine comments and like a few issues which we uh, intended to keep as questions. Uh, and the reality is that we did not get enough traction. So I said I spent a semester on this, uh, doing the system design, thinking how the models work, uh, thinking how to get the question answer pairs, and how to train the agent. But the fact of the matter was that we did not get like we did not get enough traction to even like you know launch this product. So it existed, but people really didn't use it. Right? But does that mean that this was a failure? It depends on what you wanted to get out of. Uh, for for me personally, uh, I didn't consider it as a failure because I thought there was great learning over here as well. How so? Uh, in terms of tech, this was a time, the, the time I built this, I had not taken a single AI class. So in terms of learning AI stuff uh, at a fast pace, I thought it was a great thing. Uh, in terms of learning dialogue tools, for example, uh, continuing to improve uh, the way I write Python, and to, again, you know, re uh, really get good at uh, the Telegram API and system design. So that was the tech part. But what about the non-tech part, right? So again, decomposing the problem, like what would work with users, uh, and really uh, thinking with like interviewing students, interviewing former students, uh, interviewing the professor, uh, and really seeing what could work for the user. I think those skills were really developed here again. So uh, I like to think of uh, these kind of uh, products that I use on the hacks that do uh, on a spectrum. So uh, this is this is not my own thing, but this is a very well known phenomena in the industry. So uh, I think of them on a spectrum, uh, but I think they can be divided into three categories, which is very well known. So I think the first category of products is when someone can use your product. Right. So for example, uh, there's some website there, some very very obscure website. Uh, people hardly use it. But it is there for you to use. So I would categorize the AI teaching assistant in that category, right? It existed, but people did not go and use it. The second category is something that people do use, right? So let's say something like YouTube, right? People go on YouTube every day uh, or WhatsApp, right? So I would categorize uh, two of the hacks that I just uh, showed in that category. I would say the attention spot is more useful, people use it more often than food delivery, which, which people use, but I didn't expect them to use it beyond a certain period, period of time. The third category is something that people pay to use, right? I don't have a hack uh, for this category because I think it's recently hard to build something in this category. Uh, think of Spotify Premium, for example, right? People pay to use that service. And the reason I wanted to map my hacks on this spectrum is to show you that you don't have to aim for the rightmost category in order to learn something. Sure, if you're building a startup, uh, if you're de desperately or deliberately trying to build a company, yes, it might make sense to directly aim for something that people would pay to use. But if your aim is to learn, if, you're learning, if your aim is to iterate, uh, it is perfectly fine uh, to be either just in category one or category two or be somewhere in the middle. And I would even go on to say that even if you want to build something that people would pay to use, it is completely fine to start off because it is a spectrum. It is in my opinion. To start at category one and then slowly move forward. So would people pay for the attendance score? They may, they may not, they may pay or they may not pay, right? Uh, so I, I would I would say that it's a good way to start uh, iterating from left side to the right side. But I also think that as students, we should at least aim 
for uh, something to be launched so that people can use it, right? Because it, it's, it acts as evidence of you launching something. And as we saw in the hacks, it can teach you a lot of things as well. And one fun fact, which I think was part of the marketing for this talk as well, uh, is that I ended up getting academic credit for two of these three hacks that I showed. Right? So the attendance board was actually mapped to CP 3108B, which is a project module in SOC. And one thing I've found is that, at least in my batchmates and some of the juniors I talked to is, I think people don't take enough advantage of these uh, frameworks or this uh, experience that SOC has uh, to be able to map project-based modules. So this was a pass-fail module and I got four credits for it, which is very decent, I feel. Uh, the AI teaching assistant uh, was actually mapped to CP3106, uh, which is a graded model, and I think I got a decent grade for the effort. Uh, and again, it's four credits, right? And if I can do it, you can do the same thing as well. I don't have any special powers. NUS did not give me any special favors to go and do this. This is actually open for everyone to do. So I would say that you, you can do the same. And I feel one way to think about this is to build something cool and then worry about how to map it. Because I feel that SOC has decent uh, environment or decent uh, things in place uh, to make sure that you're recognized for your effort if you have done something uh, meaningful. And even if it fails, uh, I think your effort in learning and your effort in doing something uh, will be valued. So I think all you have to do is build something cool, then find a professor who's willing to sponsor or willing to supervise that, uh, and I think then you're done, right? And I, I like this approach uh, instead of, I think, going for some random QE class that I was not interested in. Uh, and I feel jealous for students today uh, because uh, I feel that you have a big advantage compared to what me and my friends had when we were in school. So as we saw in the talk earlier today, uh, we know that AI tools uh, are incredibly powerful. And the last one year especially, we have tools like ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot, which can, which can make the building process incredibly easier uh, and faster. So building is really, really easy now. So for example, uh, last in, in, in this summer, I wanted to build a lead code extension uh, because I wanted to hide away, let's say, the problem difficulty and the problem uh, category to make a real-world internal experience. Um, and I built this extension uh, over a weekend. So I went from zero code uh, to everything that the extension requires and published it and, and submitted it for publication, everything under 48 hours, thanks to these tools. And for, for, the, for the Chrome extension, I even generated, let's say, the description, the terms, uh, and conditions, the privacy policy, et cetera. Even those I generated using uh, you know, chat GPT. So this is one example of how quickly you can build uh, if you have uh, access to these tools. And I think these tools are um, very easy for you to access, um, especially if you're a student. I think GitHub Copilot is free for um, students if you are registered properly. As an outro, uh, I think to summarize, uh, the entire uh, experience. I think it is okay to prototype first, uh, and it's completely okay to stop there if you have good reason to stop, right? And I think the best judge uh, for that is yourself, uh, depending on what goals you have. Um, secondly, I think you should chase impact, like what problems you're solving, uh, instead of doing uh, fancy tech. So sure, uh, you know, fancy tech, everyone is interested in fancy tech, um, as engineers, right? Even I'm very intrigued by new technology, uh, but that doesn't mean that I deliberately try to use that instead of solving the problem. And thirdly, I think it's perfectly okay to fail, right? I think two of the three hacks that I showed you uh, kind of failed, right? They didn't get any traction or didn't get any uh, users. And the good part, if you fail, uh, especially as a student, is that you can still get academic credit, right? So your downside, let's say you say, say, oh, why do I invest so much time uh, in building something? I already have too many modules, too many exams, uh, too many CCAs, right? At least the downside is that you can get academic credit for it. Right? I think it's very easy to map something back if you want to. And lastly, I think, which is, I, I would say the most important takeaway 
is that the best time to build is really right now and not necessarily because of the AI tools, but because you are in university and university is really, really great uh, safety net. I think you, one thing, I mean, trust me when I say this, I think I really do regret not building enough. Uh, I have many uh, half worked uh, projects on my GitHub, uh, which I hope I had finished. So I think this is really the best time uh, to build something, launch something, solve your own problems, or if you don't have your own problems, work on problems with friends, uh, and really build something to keep learning at a fast rate. Uh, I think that's all for me. Thank you so much uh, for hearing this talk. Uh, I'm open to any kind of question. What you are referring to using for the ending part, and like you hosted as working for one day, like the week. So can you repeat the last part? Hosting is a very good term. Hosting for like is the server running in for the hosting. Oh right, I think that's a good um, question. So I think the two part question. The first part is what framework I use uh, for the Telegram bot, and secondly is how did we host it, right? Uh, I think for the first part, uh, there's a like very nice third party open source library called Python Telegram bot, which we saw was well maintained. Uh, so that was one reason for using it, and Python because it was easiest, it was the easiest language for all of us to work together. Uh, secondly, on how we deployed it, uh, I think initially what we did is open a screen on a terminal. So I don't remember the exact command, but in a keyword terminal, we did open an open screen. It was like a virtual screen, and we go inside that screen, uh, run your script. We should go outside that screen. I think your script is still running. Uh, I'm not sure if this is actually how they deploy it today because I am completely detached from the project right now. I'm not sure how they deploy it right now, uh, but I think that's what we did initially uh, in the initial stages. Okay. Uh, it's not deployed locally, so we go into AWS uh, and on the AWS server, uh, I think it's through the GC2 instance that we are using. Uh, so you go there, you open the screen over there, so you see, and that's when you run the script. I think he's asking you in the mic. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just making sure I'm able to hear it. I'm just making sure that you and uh, you. Right. So the question is uh, how did we host the database? Right? Where is the database? Um, I think that's a great question. And then how do you incorporate it inside the Sure, sure. Uh, I think maybe I skipped this part. Uh, so thanks for bringing this up. Uh, so what, what we did is the Google spreadsheet that you see over here actually acts as the database. We don't have a separate PostgreSQL database or anything. Uh, the attendance records were directly updated in Google Sheets. The reason to do this was that when we interviewed TAs, when we saw what TAs were actually doing, is that even though let's say if you're a TA who are maintaining the Google Sheets, I'm a TA who's maintaining an Excel, uh, and let's say someone in the audience is actually the professor. So ultimately, what the professor was doing is maintaining a Google Sheet like or, or an Excel where everyone in the module had their attendance records collated because that's that was maybe the single source of truth. So the reason there are two reasons. One is uh, this way it would be easier for us to get uh, people on board. Right, this was a solution that they were already familiar with. Secondly, this allowed us to have a free UI, right? So for us, for our solution to work, we wanted users to be able to, we need users to be able to see the results of the attendance in real time, right? So Google Spreadsheet already gives that UI for free. Like if we were, let's say if we wanted to uh, have our own meeting, uh, we would also have to build our own UI to display the results, right? Uh, of course, the Google Spreadsheet is, is a brittle solution. It's not a perfect, you know, Postgres QA database. But it worked in our case because we wanted to move fast and we wanted to give our customers we wanted to give our customers something that they were already familiar with, something that did not require uh, a lot of extra effort. Another answer question. So yeah, we did just to clarify, we didn't have any that framework. Uh, all the frontend was just the telegram bot. It communicated with uh, our server running on AWS. Uh, and uh, we use Google spreadsheets as our DB. Uh, you might wonder what Redis was used for. So let's say how do I know, how does the bot know that you are a TA and you're not a TA? 
right? So we are mapping uh, we have a whitelist of uh, TAs that are on these, uh, and through that whitelist is how we know that this person is a TA or this person is not a TA. Uh, it is also used uh, to see which student has which row in the in the DB uh, to to update that row correctly. Yes, exactly. Uh, and the reason we wanted to use Reddit for this is that um, so let's say if you go to Google, right? Uh, if you go to Google, that is a network more like it will take some time. Whereas Redis is very, very fast because we're on the same machine. Uh, so that would you know, just speed up our, our check uh, to see if let's say the person is a TA or not a TA. Exactly, exactly. So what he was saying is that what well, like he was thinking, why not put the academic data inside Reddit as well? All right. And, and the reason exactly as you pointed out is that if we store the data on our own, let's say in some DB, some kind of DB, uh, we have to build a UI for it. Right? And we didn't want to do it. Then uh, we thought that Google is providing putting a UI and something that people are familiar with. Uh anyways also has strict um, guidelines of data privacy, so there's reticulation numbers involved. Uh, and I think, uh, as many of us would know, uh, School of Computing uses the com.ms.edu.sg uh, account, which is actually a Google Workspace uh, account. So every uh, SOP student by right, like every SOP person, whether they are a TA, a faculty, or a student, they already have uh, this ID. So it was completely okay to use um, uh, Google Sheets for something like this. Uh, okay, let let me come back to it because I didn't hear the first the question in full. Uh, let me uh, finish this first, and then when I tell you, you can put it up again, and then I can answer the question. Is that okay? Uh, go ahead. Hello. So I was wondering if you have a project in the past, and if you want to get like one credit for it, like for for you, it was D two three one zero six and D two three one zero eight. Uh, how do you actually apply for those more credits? Like, do you have like document uh, document your whole process of what do you need and fill the box, have a presentation, and like what's the process? Right. Uh, yeah, I think okay. that's a great question, which could be useful uh, to everyone here. Uh, and just just a big note, take whatever I say with a pinch of salt because I'm not really familiar with uh, the processes anymore. But in my time, I think how it would work is you try to get support from the professor first, right? Supervisor. Uh, right, and find uh, if I said who's interested in supervising you for the project. Uh, there's definitely documentation involved. So, like, I think if the module is created, like CP3106, the documentation required, the documentation requirement is even stricter. Uh, for fast fail module, I would say it's a bit less. Uh, I think so. The step will be approach a professor, talk to them how you want to do it. I think the professor may uh, like ask you to do weekly meetings or bi weekly meetings. Uh, to see like the degree of progress on this uh, and I think at the end of the semester there's also a review uh, to finalize let's say your SU grade or letter grade whatever you want to use. What, what if you already made the project like before can you still get like one credit for it? Uh, yeah that, that's a good question again so even in the case of the, the, the attendance bot we already had a prototype but we were launching it to be a product in CS 111s right so in doing that also we got those code numbers and the reason is, so we had a discussion with the professor uh, in terms of what would be a good amount of work to do for those four uh, credits that we wanted to get. And that is when we ended up working closely with the teaching team to build specific features, which I mentioned in my talk earlier, uh, for that particular module. So I think it really depends on how the conversation goes. So if let's say if you already have a project, let's say you're not prototyping, uh, I think it's perfectly fine to have a product, like, let's say a module credit, for you to take that prototype and you know, let's say launch it to uh, X number of users, get fewer users. What if they are already like launched and already have the Can you still get the same spot? Yeah, why not? I think let's say if you propose some improvements to the system, right? I'm I'm sure let's say if you're the developer, you know what's next. Like if you if you think about it, or if you don't, you can think sit down, think what's next for, for this, right? And let's say, oh, I really want let's say I really have a good site project, a website that I launched. There are a couple of people who use it, right? But I want to improve this website. I want to scale it even further. Why not? You take it to a, I think in this case, it would be even easier to convince uh, a professor, right? Because 
you already show some kind of skill and some kind of value that you're bringing to your users. So I think it would be even easier to do this. Yeah, why not? I think find people like find find like-minded profs who want to encourage something like this, uh, and I think they should be happy to um, help. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Okay, yes, for that, uh, really we have a special speaker from Dark V Labs. His name is Damon Dakinas, and he's a developer relations at Richard and Dark V Labs. So I think this is quite interesting. He's going to be talking about how he designed Richard and what's going on behind Dark V. So just for context, Dark V is a database management system, and yeah, he's going to tell you everything about it. So let's give him a round of applause. Hopefully, he hears you. Uh, all right, uh, uh, Gaborio, good to go. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me at your seminar. I would like to talk about DuckDB, which is a new kind of analytical database system. My name is Gabor Sarnyash, and I'm a developer relations advocate at DuckDB Labs. About my background, I did a PhD in software engineering in Budapest, Hungary, starting in 2014. Then I finished and I started working on more database oriented problems. And these brought me to CWI Amsterdam, which is located in the Netherlands. And it is the Dutch National Research Institute for Computer Science. It is the birthplace of quite a few seminal contributions. These include Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm and also the Python programming language, which was created at this institute in 1989. It has a very strong database architectures research group, which implemented systems like MoneyDB, VectorWise, and of course, recently, DuckDB. DuckDB is now mainly developed by a spin-off company called DuckDB Labs. This is also based in Amsterdam, and this is a rather small startup. So it has less than 20 people, and it has a strong urge to develop DuckDB, and it has maintenance and support contracts to help companies use DuckDB. So what is the context and the motivation for the work behind DuckDB? It is mostly rooted in data science. Data science, as I'm sure most of you know, is a rather murky process of trying to discover interesting things from a data set. So we formulate some interesting question, then we gather the data sets required to answer it, we clean them, we load them into some system, then we do some exploration, we do some modeling, maybe some machine learning, visualize the results or turn them into a report, and then the whole process repeats itself and we can refine our original questions and gain a deeper understanding of the data. Now, this is of course a difficult process and especially the middle part, exploring the data seems like it would be the ideal place for some database system to do this work because database systems are excellent at handling large amounts of data. But for some reason, they were not that popular. In fact, the most popular approach in data science is to use data frame libraries. So if you are in the Python world, that is likely Pandas or Polars. If you are in R, it is Dplyr or another similar framework, etc. And we notice that even if people start to hit the limitations of these frameworks, they very often don't go to database systems, but they rather switch to distributed computing systems like Spark and Dusk, which are great and they scale really nicely, but setting them up introduces a large overhead. And while they do scale horizontally most of the time, they have a rather large overhead in also in their processing. So while there are analytical database systems or data warehouses available, these are very rarely used in data science due to their difficult setup, expensive proprietary license, and also limited interoperability with existing other libraries. So we thought there is a room for a new system. So we created DuckDB. DuckDB is an analytical SQL database. So it operates on tables and it speaks a fairly standard SQL dialect. DuckDB has been developed for the last five years and it is written in C++11, which is quite an old version of C++, but this will come in handy later as I will explain in the talk. 
I would like to say that DuckDB is a system which has rather traditional internals in how the query engine and the storage work, but it also has a novel setup model in how it's deployed. And DuckDB is getting quite popular. It has now more than 1.5 million downloads a month on PyPI alone, and it's also used in other environments. So the biggest change in DuckDB compared to other traditional analytical database systems is the deployment model, which is in process. You see, traditionally, if we have a database system, then we have a client server set up. So we have a client application on the left, which is now written in Python and uses the PostgreSQL client library. And we have a database server on the right. And getting this to work requires quite a bit of upfront investment. We have to configure and operate the database server then we have to set up the connection in the client and do some authentication, as you can see from the example. And even after we have done all this, we are limited by the client protocol in the middle. You can think of this as having a narrow straw that you need to siphon the data back and forth. This is obviously a big bottleneck if it happens over the network. In fact, the founders of DuckDB, Mark Rasfeld and Hannes Müllerisen, identified this problem before starting to work on DuckDB and published these results in a VLDB paper in 2017. The client server setup has other drawbacks as well. For example, if you would like to load some data, it's not obvious where that data should be. If it's on the client side, then we have to also push this through the client protocol, which we already established is quite inefficient. If it's on the database side, then we have to gain access to the database computer, and then we have to somehow point the database server to that particular file, which can get quite cumbersome. So the idea behind DuckDB is to flip this setup and move the database server within the client application. You can see that the code is now much shorter. Indeed, there is no need to configure a server. We don't have to authenticate, and there is no client protocol required. The data is now residing in a single file format that contains all your tables. And in fact, even that is optional. So if you eschew that and you don't have any database, then the setup is as trivial as using a data frame library. Now, instead of pandas, you say import .db, and it has an in-memory database component, which can just work very nicely without ever touching the disk to save its data. And obviously, because we have a single computer and a single process, it's obvious that the data will come from somewhere on that computer. So there is no difficulty in addressing the data or pushing it through the client protocol. So with this, we put DuckDB in its unique category in the database landscape. If you think about the database landscape, as this quadrant, you can see that we have in-process systems like the incredibly popular SQLite database. And we have client server systems like Postgres, MySQL, Vertica, and Snowflake. And there are quite a few client server databases, both for transactions and analytics, but there is only DuckDB in the in-process analytical category. DuckDB is a system that we strive to make very simple, and there is one key design decision that we made to do this, and this is a rather controversial decision. Namely, we said no to any external dependencies, so we will not depend on any either any other package or DLL that you may have installed in your system. Now, obviously, we are not going to re-implement things like regular expression matching that's done incredibly well in the Google RE2 library, and we are not going to implement our own HTTP library, but these dependencies are vendored in the source code. And this is very important for portability because this means that given that these packages can be compiled with C++11, and the rest of DuckDB is also just C++11 source files, you can compile the entire system wherever you have a C++11 compiler available. And this opens up the possibility to port DuckDB to many platforms. The other simplicity philosophies of DuckDB is that you want to make it hassle-free to use 
and we want to make users to be able to pick up DuckDB gradually. So unlike many other systems, we did not develop a new query language and we, don't, we did not tweak an exotic SQL variant that takes a long time to get used to. DuckDB adopts the PostgreSQL dialect and it makes only minimal improvements on that. We work very hard to avoid surprising the user. So we have predictable performance and scalability, ideally linear scalability as the data grows. And even if the data grows larger than memory, we try to handle it with out of core operations that have graceful degradation. So you will not fall out of the cliff if you just need a few extra gigabytes to finish processing the data. And DuckDB has ACID transaction guarantees. So if something crashes, the database will still be in a consistent state and the database is durable on disk if the user wishes and specifies a database file. And finally, to make picking up DuckDB simple, we provide clients for many popular programming languages. Well, how many exactly? We have quite a selection of clients. So DuckDB being a C++ application runs standalone in the command line as a single binary file, but you can run it in all the popular data science frameworks like Python, R, and Julia. We have a Java client, a Rust client, and many other languages, including Go, Swift, Lisp, and so on. And by anywhere, we also mean any major operating system. We run on Linux, Mac OS, Windows, and even FreeBSD. And of course, these days, it's not obvious which architecture we should target. So DuckDB also supports different architectures like x86 and different variations of ARM. And of course, this means that we have quite a sophisticated build matrix because all of these combinations are valid. For example, I'm giving this talk from an Apple Silicon MacBook and my demos will be run on Python. But it's entirely possible that a data scientist is working on a Windows laptop that has an Intel CPU and is using R. So we have to package all these binaries. And indeed, we do and create pre-compiled binary packages for most combinations. And this is one thing where the in-process deployment model is actually causing difficulty for the developers. In the more traditional client-server setup, this is easier because you can assume an x86 server with, say, a Linux operating system and a standalone binary. And then you just build the client libraries for all of these combinations. And the client libraries use a standard via protocol to talk to the database. So this is something where we, the developers of DuckDB, have to do extra work to ensure the portability. But we did that extra work, and we are very proud of how portable DuckDB is. The pinnacle of this is that DuckDB can be compiled to the WebAssembly platform, and you can use shell.duckdb.org, which is a full-fledged SQL engine that's running fully in your browser, so it does not use any network communication to talk to a server. This is running via WebAssembly in compatible browsers like Firefox or Google Chrome. DuckDB is free. This is very important for the hassle-free, free, simple setup philosophy. We don't think people would use DuckDB if you would need to fiddle with some license file that you have to buy first and then put in some obscure location in the system. So we distribute it as a piece of open source software. Even among the open source software, it has the permissive MIT license. So you can fork it. You can use it in your own system without any restrictions. It is very permissive. DuckDB is also free because you don't have to buy an expensive cloud computer instance or some mainframe server to run it. So you can use your existing laptop, which if it's from the last five years, is probably quite an amazing piece of computer and run your queries on that. We like to say to users that your laptop is much, much faster than what you would think. Modern laptops have a fast disk. They have 8 to 16 CPU cores and a decent amount of memory. And most of that is wasted if you only use a web browser 
to interact with some server in the cloud or in the on-premises cluster. So we believe DuckDB is quite fast, even on the laptop. And here's a demo that I would like to show you. So here is a Jupyter notebook that you can, um, of course, already recognize. You are likely familiar with this. Um, I have a data set that consists of a couple of person nodes, and these persons are a regular social network person entities. So what you have here is a CSV with a header, and you have a bunch of entries in the CSV. Now, of course, it's not a proper CSV because you have a pipe separated format, so not the regular comma that you would expect, but the rest is fairly standard. You have RFC 3339 timestamps, you have user IDs, names, birth dates, that is just a date, and so on. So how would this work if you would like to load this with Pandas? I will start this first and then explain what it does. So we glob through all the part files of the person directory, and then we specify that we need to load it with this pipe separator. And it finished loading. You can see that it took roughly eight seconds to load the entire data set. As I mentioned, data scientists often move to Spark. So in Spark, um, we have a roughly similar setup. We have to say that we have a header. We have to specify the delimiter is a pipe character. And we say that the schema has to be inferred based on the available data. And this was running, and it also took roughly eight or nine seconds. Let's see the performance of DuckDB. We can see that this is a lot shorter. So we can just say, create this table from this CSV. And we can run it, and it takes less than one second. So loading to DuckDB on exactly the same hardware as you have seen for Pandas and Spark is roughly 10 times faster for this particular data set and also simpler to set up. So this doesn't stop at the small data set size, which was just uh, roughly 700 megabytes and 3.3 uh, million rows. You can scale much larger. Um, these are data sets from the IDBC benchmark that I co-authored and published this year at VLDB. And I did a few experiments on this very laptop that I'm presenting from, from CSV files. What you can see is that the scalability is rather linear. The compression is actually fairly impressive. So DuckDB compresses the loaded data by more than 4x. And it can read CSVs at more than 1 gigabyte per second parse them and write them to a persistent DuckDB instance, which is rather impressive. And of course, this means that if you just have a few dozen gigabytes of data, you can analyze that at basically interactive speed. You don't have to submit a job, wait for it to finish, and then continue. It is all very snappy. So how does DuckDB achieve this? I said that this is a rather traditional system as far as the internals goes, but it still selects state-of-the-art proven components. Namely, it uses a vectorized columnar database engine. I would argue that there are no breakthrough scientific results as far as the storage and execution model goes. It's all very well selected and very well complemented with new but not breakthrough results. So the problem with traditional database systems if we think about transactional systems and we would like to use them for analytics, is that they use something called a row-based storage. So all the rows, every row is stored on disk with all its attributes in a single location. And that is great because individual rows can be fetched cheaply. So if you do your typical e-commerce system or airline ticketing system, this is what you would want. However, you have to fetch all columns if you would want to fetch a given row. 
So what if we just use a few columns, which is very typical in analytics? Well, then the row format is quite inefficient and we are better off using something called columnar data storage. Here we can fetch individual data columns. So if the question is, what are the prices of this product, regardless of when it was sold and who it was sold to, then we can just get these two columns and we can save 60% of the IO. Having a columnar storage is also beneficial for compression. So because a single column has data of a single type and there is often some more logic in the column, for example, the date is typically increasing and it is doing so by small steps. These are very well compressible. Here is a very popular benchmark data set, which is TPC, and this is the line item table. And you can see that in DuckDB over the course of roughly 1.5 years, we went from no compression to using run length encoding, bit packing, dictionaries, frame of reference encoding, and so on, which ultimately yielded a 5x compression ratio in storing the data. And that, of course, saves bandwidth and makes the processing faster. The other component of having a file system is query execution. DuckDB uses something called vectorized query execution. This is in contrast with the transactional systems is tuple at a time processing and the column at a time processing that is used in some older database systems and also pandas. Let's see how these look like. Um, here we can see that the transactional systems have something called tuple at a time when they do a single row per step. Of course, this is great if you are limited in memory and definitely when these systems were invented, it was quite common to be very much limited by memory. And uh, this works really nicely, but it has a high CPU overhead per tuple because the CPU has to do a full context switch every time there is a new tuple to be processed. So for analytics, it's beneficial to do column at a time. This allows exploiting things like SIMD or SIMD, single instruction, multiple data sets. But the problem is that if we take these columns, then we can materialize large intermediates in memory. And these can be gigabytes each, which can easily cause running out of memory, which happens quite often with data frame libraries when the data set sizes get larger, even medium sized. So DuckDB and many other analytical database systems use a Goldilocks approach where we have vectorized processing with the vectors meaning a chunk of the columns. And these chunks are processed by the query engine and then we move on to the next chunk. And this is perfect because we can still reap the benefits of using SIMD instructions. We can have pipelining in our query operators, but our intermediate sizes are small, ideally so small that they fit in the L1 cache. So to exploit this data model, DuckDB uses vector sizes of 2048 rows, and this tends to work really well for analytical queries. The problem is, of course, is that if we really want to go full on and exploit the benefits of SIMD, then we would have to port the code specifically to the ARM architecture or Graviton CPUs or for Apple Silicon CPUs or Intel AVX 512. And this is an impossible amount of work for a small team. So what we ultimately do is that we shape our code in a way that it has tight loops and we rely on the compiler to auto vectorize the code. And it turns out that modern compilers, modern C++ compilers in particular, are quite amazing. And if you construct your code in the right way, they will auto vectorize it on different platforms. So you get the portability without having to write specific platform dependent code. And you also get the performance. DuckDB also exploits a few more advanced query optimization techniques. So it does expression rewriting, and it has an advanced join ordering algorithm, it does subquery flattening, and it does projection and filter pushdowns. 
These are available to some extent in data frame libraries, but they are more manual to use. And meanwhile, they are automatically performed in DuckDB. Regarding concurrency control, I mentioned that we want to avoid any surprises to the user. So we have ACID compliance, we have atomic consistent, isolated, and durable properties guaranteed in DuckDB. We have a write ahead log. So if there is a crash, you do not lose your data. And we have checkpointing. Uh, regarding the concurrency modes, DuckDB does have a limitation. You can see the illustrations that we either do a single writer process that can of course, read and write a database, or we have multiple reader processes, but then these processes are not able to write the database. The rationale behind this setup is that you would like to cache in RAM as much as possible for fast analytical queries. But this limitation is actually something that we would like to acknowledge openly, and we ask users to take this seriously. If you have multiple writers, and your workload is highly transactional, then DuckDB is not the ideal system for that workload. So, of course, this is great, but it wouldn't be worth a lot if you would only do filtering and aggregation. Luckily, DuckDB is a feature-rich system, and this starts with the input and output formats. Uh, the input formats are CSV, as I have already demonstrated. We also read Parquet, which is a binary columnar data format, and JSON files. And we interact quite tightly with data frame libraries like pandas, dplyr, and we can also write numpy arrows, arrays. Um, regarding the query language, I mentioned that we support a Postgres dialect. We do almost full support, filtering, joins, aggregates, subqueries, correlated subqueries, window functions, as you see on the right, common table expressions, and two features that I will um, demonstrate. We have pivot and unpivot, with pivot converting the data from a narrow format to a wide format, and unpivot doing the exact opposite, just making the table longer, long, uh, unwinding the columns. And we do as of joins, which are fuzzy temporal lookups. So this is very useful, for example, in the financial domain, where we have two sort of stocks. We have a ticker for STCK1 and STCK2, and these come in at every hour. And then we have the holdings of how many shares we have. And these, as you can see, do not perfectly align with the stock prices. So they are shifted by half an hour. And matching these up would be difficult in traditional SQL. But with the as of joins, we can ask what is the price as of this time. And formulating the query is a matter of just saying, I would like to join using the as of join operator on the ticker value with the when column having passed the others when column. So as of that time. And you can see that this is really nice and concise and that DB returns the result to you. So one more thing that we like in DuckDB is DuckDB's so-called friendly SQL. Let me show you what I'm on about. So we have loaded this uh, person table previously, and you can see that it has a bunch of columns that you would expect. It has the creation date, it has IDs, first name and last name, gender, birthday, and so on. And we can run the query select everything from person, but this already made us realize something. The select asterisk is a rather pointless operation. So we made that optional, and now we can say from person without specifying select star. And this is you know, a tiny improvement, but people really like it when they can just say from this table, from that table, and do their data exploration more efficiently. One thing that people like perhaps even more is this little comma. So we made it possible to use a trailing comma, meaning that if you would like to maybe comment out uh, the first expression or comment out the second expression, you do not have to fiddle with the trailing comma of the query. 
Another thing is group buys. So you can see that I would like to find the most popular first name in a given period by saying, I would like the first name, I would like to have its count and then order by descending. But if I run this query, I will get an error and the error message will say that this must appear in a group by function. So then I go back and say, okay, let's give the system what it wants. Let's group by first name and now everything is great. But sooner or later, I'm bound to bump into this again. So if I say last name, this will again give me an error because it will say, well, last name must appear in the group by. Um, and this really begs the question, why cannot the system figure out on its own? And the DuckDB, in DuckDB, it can. So you can say group by all. And this will take care of grouping by all of the columns that are not part of the aggregate expression. So you can say group by first name or group by last name. And you don't have to worry about continuously editing group by all. So you can see that these Friendly SQL extensions are really subtle. They are definitely not difficult to pick up or difficult to understand for newcomers, but they help you just analyze your data a bit nicer. Another thing along these lines is, is exclude. So say that we have observed that we have quite a lot of columns, but it's actually just the creation date and the email that are too wide. So we can say exclude creation date and email. And it just takes all the rest of the attributes without you having to manually spell out the names of the attributes. And you can continue your analysis just like that. And finally, let's take another look at that email field. So you may remember that email was this semicolon separated field. And obviously, that is really difficult to work with in SQL. So what we can do is that we can split it based on the semicolon character, and then we can unnest it. And if we do so, then we get the regular first normal form relational database format, which is much easier to work with. All right, so we can do friendly SQL and we can load many common formats, but we can also load data sources like MySQL, PostgreSQL and SQLite. So you don't have to do a huge CSV dump. We can just hook on your existing transactional system and query the data in that. And then finally, we realize that not everything is confined to the user's laptop. So we not only read from the disk, but we also read from HTTP, we read from S3 buckets, Google Cloud Storage, Cloudflare, um, Azure buckets, and so on. All right. Still related to simplicity, DuckDB has really strong Python integrations. So I mentioned that we can read and write Pandas data frames, but the way this happens is surprisingly simple. So what DuckDB does is it's actually taking a look at what Python variables do you have. So you have a dictionary here that's turned into a pandas data frame called my underscore df. And it turns out that in DuckDB, you can just use that my underscore df variable name and put it in a from clause. And because there is no my underscore df table in your DuckDB database, it will look around in the Python environment and pick up on this data frame. Moreover, say that you have already an elaborate Pandas application, but you have one aggregate that's proven to be difficult. If that's the case, then you can just do the DuckDB query on that particular operation, then take the result and then do .df, which will turn the result back into a Pandas data frame. So you can jump in and out of the Pandas world from DuckDB as often as you would like, and this is all done in a very seamless way. And moreover, it's not only seamless to you, it's also 
something called zero copy. So DuckDB reads the Pandas data frames binary in the memory directly, and you don't have to create unnecessary duplicates. This is, of course, something that's only possible if your database is in process, because then it can access the same memory that the Pandas library is writing. Another very popular framework in Python is NumPy. So in DuckDB, if you have a, num, a NumPy um, import, you can take your data set in DuckDB and use dot fetch NumPy, and this will return a NumPy array that is then just like any other NumPy array, and you can use things like np.sum to add together these numbers. So DuckDB is all very neat, but obviously a single database system cannot possibly cover all sorts of use cases. And we also want to keep the system quite lean and quite nifty so that you can deploy it on even low power hardware. And this led us to create an extension mechanism. So the extension mechanism is something which allows you to hook in new types, functions, or operators into DuckDB. But it's actually quite powerful. You can also add new SQL syntax or a new memory allocator. And following the eat your own duck food developer principle, many DuckDB features, which are quite core and important features, are implemented as extensions. So HTTPS is an extension or JSON support is an extension, and so is Parquet. I think if you would like to play with DuckDB as a hacker, then this is a very nice and gradual way to get started. We have an extension template repository on GitHub that you can clone and get started. And adding something like a new macro or a new function into DuckDB is quite easy and very rewarding. One extension that is definitely on the heavy side is the spatial extension. So this adds geospatial types for DuckDB, including points, polygons, etc., And it has functions to work on these, like a function to calculate distances. And you can see that this is very useful if you have something like a data set with geospatial information. This is the famous New York Taxi data set where you can see that we can calculate the aerial distance and the trip distance reported and take the difference between them using the DuckDB spatial extension without having to manually tinker and implement something like aerial distance in SQL. So DuckDB is obviously a database management system, but there are actually quite a few organizations around it. DuckDB itself is an open source project and it is under the umbrella of what is called the DuckDB Foundation. The foundation is a nonprofit that owns the intellectual property of the DuckDB source code. Commercial support for DuckDB is provided by DuckDB Labs. This is the company where I work in. This is a startup. And there's another startup based in the United States. This is called MotherDuck. And MotherDuck implements a serverless analytics platform based on DuckDB, with the idea being that you run DuckDB on your laptop, but you also have a counterpart in the cloud that can help with the really heavy operations. And then you can share the load in something called hybrid execution. Regarding to our future plans, people ask us when V1.0 will come out. Well, next year is very likely that V1.0 will come out. And the main feature of this release will be a stable storage format. So we would like to have a storage format that is from there on backwards compatible, meaning future versions of DuckDB must be able to read this format. To reach 1.0, obviously, we want the system to mature and be more stable. So we do very thorough testing. In particular, I would like to give a shout out to Manuel Rigger at NUS, who has worked on the SQL answer project, which is used quite heavily to test DuckDB. Of course, we also do fuzzing, which helps us uncover further issues. Um, performance optimizations are of course, something that we can never get enough of. So we are working on the query optimizer. We are working on even better out-of-core processing and a CSV reader that's even faster. 
So if you found this interesting, then give DuckDB a spin. It's actually very easy to get started with DuckDB because it's pre-installed in Google Colab. So you just start a new Google Colab notebook, say import DuckDB, and off you go. We have a comprehensive documentation with references and guides for various client APIs. You can grab it as a single PDF file for offline use. So to sum up, DuckDB is a new kind of analytical database system, and most of the revolutionary part is in its in-process deployment model, which was previously not used for analytical processing. It has full SQL support and a couple of friendly options. It's highly portable, and it's also extensible. So if you would like to know anything more about DuckDB, then it's time for a Q&A, and thank you for your attention. All right, so yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, so for the first question from KR, he said that you mentioned you shape your code in the right way so that compilers auto generate SIMD instructions. Do you know examples of properties of code that lend well to compiling into SIMD enabled code? Yes, so the key thing is to avoid branching because if you branch, then uh, SIMD is very unlikely to trigger. And also just having a tight loop, a for loop that goes from zero to 2047 and does a single thing with an array. That is something that is quite reliably picked up by compilers. All right, uh, next question is, uh, your career journey is super interesting, coming from an academic background then becoming a developer relations advocate. What made you choose to go down this path? Right, so I was, of course, in the research group where DuckDB was born, and it was difficult not to notice how successful DuckDB is. And this coincided with me finishing a large, roughly six-year block of work that was on performance engineering of graph data processing, designing benchmarks, etc. And I wanted to gain inspiration for a new line of research. And I thought, let's see what DuckDB is used for. And this led me to become a developer relations advocate at DuckDB. So what I'm currently doing in terms of my own career is that I'm trying to expose myself to all sorts of interesting use cases. And I am fairly certain that many of these will have some interesting unsolved research problems. and. I am very happy to eventually return to academia and work on those research problems. Okay, and the next question is from Chenrik. It says, um, can you explain the architectural differences between DuckDB and traditional RDBMS systems like PostgreSQL or MySQL, and how do these differences affect performance and scalability? Um, sure. So one of the differences is the data layout that I touched on in the talk. So these transactional systems are row-based and the data layout in DuckDB is column-based. The execution is different. So they have a tuple at a time execution model while DuckDB is vectorized. And their model is that you run it on the server side. So these are client server databases where you talk to the database via a client protocol. But I would add something that's very important and not architectural, which is that DuckDB is a very young system and uh, it's also an analytical system. And this allowed us to move very quickly and break things. And by this, I mean that we basically broke the storage, every single release in the last um, three, four years. So DuckDB could move in a very agile way. And because this is not the primary storage of companies yet, we could just iterate very quickly and improve. And also this is true for the SQL improvements. Um, the traditional SQL systems often take a very long time to adopt new syntax, even if the new syntax comes from the SQL standard. So DuckDB in the meantime can just say, okay, we are adding a trailing comma, we are adding group by all, and 
none of our users complain because of this. All right, so for our next question is by KR. On top of pivot, unpivot, I saw that DuckDB supports a cube bar function that draws an ASCII art bar chart. How does DuckDB pick what new SQL constructs to add, especially those outside the SQL standard? Right, so I would say this is a rather ad hoc process in general. We try to keep an eye out on what the other major players do, like Snowflake or ClickHouse or Databricks. So obviously, if they do something and it is really popular, then this is something uh, DuckDB is also likely adopting. And it's also driven by client demand. So if a client is really interested in a particular feature, then that gets implemented into DuckDB. And we also have a community forum. So there we have GitHub discussions and we keep track on the requests that keep coming back and we tackle those to make our users happier. Okay, and for our next question by IT department, considering how many DB companies rely on big data distributed deployment, but DuckDB is single node, in terms of commercialization, what is DuckDB's idea of how Mother Duck is to be used by customers? I think Mother Duck, and I'm not speaking on behalf of Mother Duck, but it seems to me that this is a warehousing platform for the cloud. And if you have, say, a department with 100 data scientists, then it makes sense to have something in the cloud that is having a catalog of all your tables, all their connections, and Mother Duck will allow you to do that, and it will also allow you to run DuckDB locally. And with this hybrid execution model, you can move data back and forth. And that is something I think will be really powerful when uh, Mother Duck is picked up by users. OK, I think we have time for three more questions. OK, so for the next right. um, is by path. My understanding is that DBMSs are quite famous for being obsessively tested and having incredible test coverage. Any unique slash cool ways DuckDB test their code base? So there is a SQL Lancer that I mentioned. We have a fuzzer that is running continuously in our CI jobs and is actually uncovering quite a few meaningful issues. And I would say that there is this uh, saying, I think, attributed to Eric Raymond, which is, in the eyes of many, all bugs are shallow. So being open source and being super easy to be used is actually really helpful because many of our users just construct data inputs that we would never think of. So we often get really high quality uh, bug reports, which are down to earth, like, to the point, really easy to reproduce and uh, super helpful for our developers to fix bugs. Okay, uh, two more questions. This one is a fun one. Uh, a random question, what was the motivation for starting up DuckDB and for branding the projects with Ducks? Oh, that's a, a nice and, and recurring question. So we are based in Amsterdam, which has lots of canals and uh, it is, not too uncommon here for people to live on houseboats. And one of the founders of DuckDB, Hannes Müllisen, lived on houseboat and he had a duck as a pet. So the pet duck was the namesake of the company and the project as well. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll repeat the question again. Um, do you see DuckDB at some point become a benchmark for analytical in-process databases? Um, what I see is more like a psychological effect because people had this notion that you can use Pandas on your computer if you have like 200 megabytes of CSV file. That's of course widely understood to be okay. Um, but then of course, many people have two gigabytes or 20 gigabytes of CSV files. And then they often moved to some cluster setup, which was quite inefficient because of all the overhead associated with that. And DuckDB is showing that you can open your laptop, you don't have to obtain any fancy hardware, 
install this software, which is very easy to install. And then you can go up to 10 gigabytes, 50 gigabytes, maybe even more if uh, your queries are not too join heavy. So it is putting things into perspective uh, because the last decades were, of course, very prolific as far as memory speed, memory size, and CPU performance go. You just have to have code that exploits all the parallelism and all the cleverness in modern CPUs. All right. I think that's all the time that we have for the questions today. Uh, thank you so much, Gabo, for your time. And uh, another round of applause. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me.